we're mixing it all the way up today. So we'll just start. Based on a true story, those five words and knowing somewhere along the line what you're about to sit down and watch happened or a similar event took place makes things so much more intense. And although with films there is a fine line between a true story and completely made up, there are countless films that use the base on a true story status to spark people's interest. Yeah. Whether that's a paranormal event that has taken place or an infamous murder. Well, here are five successful movies that were based on or inspired by true stories. Sit back and enjoy. What's the first that comes to your mind? I'm trying to think of books that claim to be based on a true story. I know that The Shining by Stephen King is supposedly loosely based on a true story, they say. How much of it is true? I mean, I don't know. Debatable. But when I hear those words, I don't always buy it. Especially, or specifically, when it has to do with the paranormal. If it's a true crime story and there's documentation and evidence of the event occurring, okay. And those things actually do arrive to really scare me. But, yeah, nothing says the holidays like horror, so <laughs> here we are. An American Haunting American Haunting was released in 2006 and tells the story of a family haunted by an entity that focuses on the youngest daughter. The film is billed as based on true events, so let's talk about the real story of the Balwich. In early 1800, John Bell and his family settled in Tennessee, and one day in 1817, when inspecting his cornfield, John encountered a deformed-looking animal with the body of a dog and the head of a rabbit that disappeared after he shot it. I'm already skeptical. <laughs> that evening, the Bell family heard strange beating noises coming from outside, and the Bell children complained that something was pulling at their bed covers and throwing their pillows in the night. Bell's youngest daughter Betsy was also waking up with slap marks and welts on her face and body. As the locals became aware of the activity and the supposed entity responsible, it became known as the Bell Witch. Over time, the Bell Witch's taunting turned to John and even threatened to kill him. Eventually, he became increasingly unwell and the entity mercilessly taunted him throughout his illness, apparently cursing and shouting from around their home. On December the 20th, 1820, John succumbed to his mysterious illness, and after his death, the family found a small vial of poison in the cupboard. Apparently, as they picked up the poison, a voice was heard saying that it gave old Jack a big dose of it, which sorted him right out. After John's funeral, the Bell Witch's presence was almost non-existent, but a year later, it visited John's widow and told her it would return in seven years. As promised, it reappeared in 1828, and after hanging around for three weeks, it said it would return to Bell's nearest descendant in 107 years, which would be in 1935. That descendant was Dr. Charles Bailey Bell, and although he wrote a book about the Bell Witch and its supposed hauntings it caused his family, it's unclear if he got the promised visit. Nowadays, the Bell Witch is still remembered and is often blamed for unexplainable manifestations in and around the area of the old Bell family farm as well as sounds of children playing, candles flickering, and malfunctions of electrical equipment. This was all the American haunting creators needed for the inspiration behind the movie, which they have stated before is based on the Bell Witch entity. Interesting. You know, my mind doesn't even let me go to some of these places. For example, I don't live by candlelight, but if my light's flickering, I would think... Weak bulb, <laughs> I don't know, need an electrician. I wouldn't even consider paranormal activity as an option. If you have a paranormal activity story that you believe, let us know down below. Child's Play. The first Child's Play film was released in 1988 and told the story of a fictional serial killer known as Charles Lee Ray. While on the run from police, he is mortally wounded, but before he dies, he takes cover in a toy store where he uses a voodoo ritual to transfer his soul into a talking doll. I'm sure if you're a horror fan, you have seen it, so I won't go into details, but the doll is I've called Chucky and is acquired by a six-year-old boy and basically goes on a murderous killing spree. It was followed by a further six movies, with rumours of another in 2017. And although subsequent films have been somewhat ridiculed, it's long been said that Chucky is based on a real-life cursed doll known as Robert. Robert was given to Florida artist Robert Jean Otto in 1906 when he was just six years old. It was strange looking, being handmade with I, a wire frame, old yes. clothing, straw, and apparently Jean's own hair by one like of his family's servants. It. The servant who made the doll was grieving the loss of her own child at the time and was resentful of Otto's family, claiming they had mistreated her. It was also thought that she was skilled in black magic and voodoo and put a spell on the doll. 
Jean became obsessed with his new toy and was often seen having conversations with it, nothing too out of the ordinary for a child of his age. But as he grew up, the doll became his best friend and the Otto family would report it giggling and walking around the family's home. Jean went on to become a well-known artist and visitors to his house, along with his wife, told stories of the doll's strange behaviour. Beautiful house. After Jean died in 1974, Robert was banished to the attic and not seen for a while. When the house was sold, the new owner, Myrtle Reuter, discovered Robert and soon became attached to him. She even took him with her when she moved six years later. However, in 1994, Robert was donated to the Fort East Martello Museum, as she claimed he was haunted and was moving around the house by himself. A few months later, Myrtle passed away. Initially, Robert was not on display, but as visitors learned that he was housed at the museum and kept inquiring, he was put in a cabinet for the public to view. Almost immediately, visitors experienced problems with their cameras and electronic devices if they tried to photograph him. And letters started to That's arrive weird. at the museum addressed to Robert, asking for forgiveness for being disrespectful to him, as they were experiencing nothing but trouble after their visit. Robert began to draw the attention of ghost hunters and psychics, with many believing that Robert, much like Chucky, had been joined by the spirit of his lifelong partner, Jean, and that was and still is the reason for his strange behavior. Despite not being linked to any deaths or serious accidents, all of the stories surrounding Robert sparked the imagination for the people behind Child's Play, and a crazy killer doll called Chucky was born. Okay, first, the doll is hideous. So hideous that it could be scary. I wouldn't want it in my house. But I wonder if these people are suffering from some sort of collective delusion in believing that the doll is walking around the house and giggling. Or do you think that that's actually possible? That's not rhetorical. Please leave your thoughts on that. We'll take a room temperature check on this one. Because if someone comes to me and they say, I've seen a doll walking around my house. It's laughing. It's very menacing. I would think... Sure. And maybe that thinking would get me killed very quickly in a horror film because I don't believe it. Or maybe it lasts until the end, you know? Glass half full. If I saw it with my own two eyes, I would likely think differently. But I would also be heavily questioning my sanity. So I don't really know what to say about that one. This is unrelated, but sort of related. I remember in a class once, I read this paper that was theorizing that inanimate objects could have memory. I'm going to try to find that for you. It's, I don't know how hard that'll be. If I find it, I'm going to put it in the research, or excuse me, the resources down below. Personally, I don't think so, but it would have interesting implications on what we believe consciousness to be. Anyway, after you read it, let me know what you think. Borderland. Based in Mexico, this 2007 horror film starts with three college students who head out for the weekend on a well-earned break from their studies. But one of them goes missing, and it turns out he's been kidnapped by a cult to be used in a ritual sacrifice. The horrific and violent scenes that follow as the students try to rescue their friend are pretty intense, and the gore level is certainly there. But what's even worse is the fact it's based on the real story of Adolfo Constazo. Constanza was born in Miami in 1962, but grew up in Puerto Rico, where he was baptized Catholic and was also an altar boy. However, from a young age, he accompanied his mother on trips to Haiti to learn voodoo. And after the family moved back to Miami, Constanza became an apprentice to a local sorcerer and got involved in a religion called Palo Mayacum, which practices in animal sacrifice. As an adult, Constanza moved to Mexico City, where he set up a profitable business, casting spells to bring good luck which would often involve sacrifices of more exotic animals, like zebras, lion cubs, and snakes. As he gained in popularity, his clients became wealthy drug dealers, hitmen, and high-ranking members of the Mexican society, all of which started demanding more extreme rituals and violence, and Constanzo began raiding graveyards for human bones that he mixed in his cauldron. But it wasn't long before he needed fresher humans. He was soon involved with several corrupt police officers and powerful drug cartels, and became convinced his rituals and spells were responsible for the success of them, demanding they pay him more. One family, the Casados, rejected to pay the extra payment, and seven members of their family disappeared. They were later found dismembered, with their toes, ears, brain, fingers, and spine missing. In the years that followed, okay. Constanzo moved to a remote ranch in the desert, where lots of his sadistic ritual murders were carried out. For example, in 1989, Constanzo's hitmen abducted student Mark Kilroy, and shortly after, Constanzo murdered him, saying Kilroy had been murdered as a good superior human brain was required for one of his potions. Constanzo fled to Mexico City, where the police finally caught up with him, and he was shot dead by one of his cult members at his request. 
The total death count on Constanzo's hands for the pure use of the rituals is believed to be as high as 70. Okay. Completely believe that one. True crime. Corroborated storyline evidence. We know that there are cases of cult sacrifice and it's very scary. Wow. The Strangers. This horror film starring Liv Taylor and Scott Speedman centers on the pair who are relentlessly stalked by a trio of faceless madmen. There is no apparent motive for the terror these killers inflict on the couple within the walls of their own home, and the suspense and scare factor has led many to say this is an underrated masterpiece. It the masks remind me of The Purge. In the opening credits, it states the plot is inspired by true events, and its director, Brian Bertino, has admitted it's loosely based on a few different incidents, one of which happened to him during his childhood when strangers knocked on his door when his parents were out and asked to speak to someone who didn't live there. They left, but it later transpired that most of the homes in the neighborhood had been broken into that night, and the people who knocked the door were responsible. This stuck with Brian, as he knew the strangers could have done anything to him whilst his parents were out, and the fact they robbed several houses that night means he came face to face with people who were not afraid to break the law. But Bertino has also mentioned the Manson family murders that we all know about was another inspiration for the film and also the lesser known Keddy Cabin Murders, which I talked about in depth in this video, if you want to find out more about that. Basically, a family were brutally killed in their cabin in Plumas County, California, and despite a huge investigation, to date, the case is unsolved and with no real motive and the attacks taking place in the family's own home, this tragic true crime has chilling similarities to The Strangers. Wow. Wolf Creek. This Australian horror film was released in 2005 and tells the story of three young backpackers, Ben, Kirsty, and Liz, who return from a hike in Wolf Creek National Park in the Australian Outback, only to find that their car won't start. When a friendly bushman turns up and offers the help, they gladly accept, but after he tows their car to his camp and they stay the night, they soon realise this guy is anything but their friend. After being drugged, they are all kidnapped and the two girls die, with Ben being the only one who manages to survive. At the end of the movie, the end card makes you believe the story is real and the tone and the way the film was marketed as based on true events, unsettled backpackers in Australia into believing there was still a feral madman wandering in the outback. But how true to life was this film and what actual event was it based on? While it's thought the director based the psychopathic Bushman on a real life tour guide he had met some years earlier, but it's said that the real life Australian killer Ivan Milat had a heavy influence on the movie's plot. Milat was found guilty of killing seven people and the attempted murder and imprisonment of another, although he may have murdered many more in what was called the Backpacker Killings. Milat's first victims were British backpackers Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters. Their bodies were found in Belanglo State Forest after they had been reported missing four months earlier. Joanne had been repeatedly stabbed with an unusual injury to her spine and Caroline had been stabbed and shot in the head ten times. A primitive fireplace and cigarette butts were also discovered near the scene. No progress was made in finding the killer, then in 1993, two more bodies were found. They were missing backpackers, James Gibson and Deborah Everest. The spinal injury to the couple and the same primitive fireplace nearby convinced police they were dealing with the same killer. Oh, An extensive God. search of Belanglo Forest was conducted and it took almost a month to uncover any other bodies, when a female German hitchhiker was found who had been missing since 1991. Then just three days later, the bodies of a further two German backpackers were found. Milat was finally arrested and sentenced to life in prison. Wolf Creek is also incredibly similar, although not thought to have been inspired by the Australian 2001 killing, where a British couple who were travelling through the Australian outback were told to pull over by a mechanic named Bradley John, who shot one of them and kidnapped the other, who thankfully managed to escape. The film was in fact delayed its release in Northern Australia because of the Bradley trial. So it's safe to say that if you watch Wolf Creek, it's one of those films where almost exactly what you see has unfortunately taken place, and hopefully will not, but could happen again. So that's five horror movies that were inspired by real events. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you very soon in the next video. This was from a channel called Top Fives. You're going to find the channel and this video linked in the description. If you can think of another example of a scary film or book, based on true events, let us know what it is. And if you want to see more videos like this, tell me. I like mixing up the subjects. Although I'm not a big horror fan. Horror. Gosh. Horror. <laughs> it's not the easiest English word. I don't mind watching videos on subjects that I don't typically gravitate towards. 
If you have other suggestions like this one, let me know the title down below. And I can't really think of anything else based on a true story that I know. I used to watch Fargo, which they claim to be based on a true story. Fargo the series, not Fargo the movie. Although I'm not sure if that's exactly true or if it's just a claim. If you haven't seen the series, season one is so, so good. And speaking of that, we'll just move on to the book recommendation because recently I watched this show called Fall of the House of Usher, which is based on a short story by Edgar Allan Poe. And then I reread the short story. I think the series is a lot better, although they did take a lot of liberties. In the series, it's about a family, the Ushers, who are very wealthy and they're engaged in unethical business practices, we'll say. Seemingly all of the children of that family are dying one by one. So I'll link that for you. There's also a free audiobook version of that on YouTube. So I'll make sure to add that. As far as music recommendations, the whole concept of Halloween on Christmas makes me think of that Blink-182 song, I Miss You. There's a lyric, we'll have Halloween on Christmas, literally just that. But I'm not going to add Blink-182. I'm trying to think now of songs with somewhat sinister lyrics. I feel if I look through my Spotify, I'll be able to find some, but... I was in my friend's car the other day who had a Talking Head CD. And this person actually has a very extensive CD collection, which I think is becoming more and more rare. But anyway, Psycho Killer by the Talking Heads. I'll link that for you. And... Have you ever heard Every Breath You Take by The Police? Where the lyrics go, every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. Which I think a lot of people sometimes find very romantic, but for me, it's giving stalker. So we'll add that song. And lastly, I usually recommend a song without lyrics, but I was listening to this collab with Sade and MF Doom. Sade being the Nigerian British beauty, jazz songstress. And MF Doom is, I believe he's a British as well, or at least British born rapper. Someone on YouTube made a mashup of both of their songs into an album and it is so beautiful. There's something so curious about the juxtaposition between his lyrics and her beats. The track I like the most from that album is called Air, but I'll also just link the whole album and you let me know what you think. Other than that, that's all I have. So I wish you guys a happy holidays. Thank you for watching with me and I'll catch you in the next.